Shouting loud, hallelujah. Let's rise to our feet, please. As you raise up our two hands to the Lord, and sing this song loud and clear. You are God from beginning to be end. There is no place for argument. You are God by your side. You are God, you are God. From beginning to the end, there is no place for argument. You are God of by yourself. You are God, you are God. Sing it loud and clear. Your voice be the loudest, say, You are God. You are God. Oh, yes, sir. From the beginning to the end. There is no place for argument. You are God all by yourself. I have an every power. Complete in him. I am complete in him. 
My soul, Holy Ghost of fire, mighty cause of fire, fire burning in my soul, fire burning in my soul, fire burning in my soul, Holy Ghost of fire, mighty cause of fire, fire burning in my soul, our Lord God. The house made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Our Lord God, the house made the heavens and the earth by the house. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Hallelujah. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Hallelujah. Great and mighty God. Great and so mighty be. Mighty be. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing is too to be God for thee. Behold, I am the Lord. Thy God of all flesh. Is there anything? Is there anything to ask for me? Hallelujah. Is there anything? 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 anything to ask for me? Is there anything? Is there anything to ask for? Is there anything, anything, to ask for? Is there anything, is there anything to ask for? I didn't took out my hand. I didn't find the blood of the Lamb. I didn't the blood of Jesus. I've been to Calvary. I've been to Calvary. I've been to Calvary. I keep my hands in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I keep the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. My life has been made whole. 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 Shout hallelujah. Within the next three minutes, there are seven destiny recovery prayers to pray. Pray them with fire and with power. Pray them with all your hearts before you sit down this morning. Say every power that wants my helpers to die before reaching me. There is somebody who needs to really pray this prayer seriously. Can I hear you shouting this loud? You are alone. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and decree it. 
every pound that was my air pastor died before I could cheat me. But party cutting the abusha. In Jesus, then we pray. There is someone here. If you would pray this next prayer with boiling spiritual anger, before this day runs to an end, your unending laughter shall start. Say, my stubborn enemies, hear the word of the Lord. Carry your Lord in the name of Jesus. Command them to carry their loads. Jesus. Aha, aha, aha. Open your mouth, open your mouth, open your mouth, open your mouth. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm making fantastic progress this morning. Can I hear the sister Sarah shouting this loud and clear? Every serpent assigned to bite my destiny. Can I hear the sister saying it again? Is that the loudest the sisters can shout this word? Brothers, let me hear you roaring like thunder. Everybody together now. Die by fire. In the name of Jesus. Yes, if it's assigned to bite my destiny. Command it happens to die. Yes. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Say, every covum panel set up against me. Can you shout this loud? Shout it loud and clear. Scatter in the name of Jesus. Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, I want you to really lose your temper in this last two prayers. Pass! Which holding my joy. What are you waiting for? In the name of Jesus. This is not a prayer to negotiate. Jesus. Jesus. Voices speaking against my rising up. Shut up. Can I hear you shouting it again? Your voice is not loud enough. Pray it with only anger. In the name of Jesus. Voices speaking against my rising up. Shut up in the name of Jesus. In 
Jesus name we pray a louder amen father we thank you for a time like this accept our thanks in the name of Jesus father once again open our understanding today and lay your hands upon our lives in Jesus mighty name we pray let's have a seat. God bless you on third Sundays like this we have the happy home Sundays and very soon member of that, members of that team will come and answer some questions the questions we have been sending to them praise the Lord the school of godly parenting we started to discuss this last time and we stop at 11. We continue just a little bit further this morning before we begin to answer the questions. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, 6. Without anybody telling us, we can see that this generation is in serious trouble parenting wise this generation has the most rebellious kind of children and a lot of parents are in trouble so if you want to talk about happy home there is no way we are going to escape this kind of thing Proverbs 22.6 train train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. There's so many religions who do not do any evangelism at all. All they do is to capture their children young. And that is how the religion continues. Train. Train. For you to be a trainer, it means you must know something. If you don't know something, you cannot train. And there the problem comes. Many are parents, but they are not trainers. Many understand all the techniques to use to sleep with women, but they have no idea how to train those children. And this is where the problem lies. In Genesis chapter 18, Genesis 18, I read verse 18. Genesis 18:18. 18, 18. See that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Listen to verse 19. For I know him. For I know him. That he will command his children. And his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. To do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Say I know him Abraham. He will control those who should be controlled. I'm praying for anyone here that the enemy has diverted the destiny of your children. That the Holy Ghost will overshadow them today in the name of Jesus. Let your amen be loud and clear. God said, I trust Abraham. I know him. I know him. I wonder how many parents God can say that about. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We are talking about the school of godly parenting. Deuteronomy chapter 6, from 6 to 9. And this was which I commanded this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless before thy hands. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. 
on thy gates. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 4. Well, let's meet, read from verse 1. Ephesians 6 from verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee. That is, children who do not honor their father and their mother, the Bible is issuing a curse that it will not be well with them. That's what it's trying to tell us. So, but if you honor them, it will be well with thee. And that thou mayest live long on the earth. That is, children who do not honor their parents, they will die young. Verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to love, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can see those various passages we've read. Some parents came for counseling. They look very worried. In fact, the wife was crying. I listened to them carefully. Said so there are three children. Said, so Daddy, Mommy, we need to have a short meeting with you. So before the prayer meeting in the evening, which they rarely do, the children said, Daddy, Mommy, the, el- the most senior one was the one talking. Said, so Daddy, Mommy, that as a matter of fact, that we will not serve your God. Told them, so we're not serving your God. Because this is your God. Took you away from us. They turned to mommy. You, mommy. You leave home in the morning with instructions. Instructions for us. And then when you come back in the evening, you are coming to pass judgment. So as for you, daddy, you are never around. You are just going all over the place. So, just listen. You be serving, that's your God. We will not serve your God. He shook them. That's why they came. And I began to advise. Do you do regular prayer meetings? I said, no. Occasionally. Do you talk to them about God? Occasionally. Do you have a prayer program for this family? No. But, husband... Elder, mommy, woman leader. And the children said, We will not serve your God. It is parenting failure. I'm praying once again that any arrow of failure fired into any home will backfire in the name of Jesus. But the most dramatic I've seen was some years back. This woman came for counseling. And she started these stories of war. She built a shop. The shop was destroyed. Her husband was sacked in the place of work. Then the husband fell down. Broke his leg. They put POP, plaster of Paris on that leg. After the hospital had removed the plaster of Paris, the leg remained like this, not bending anymore. She cried as she spoke to me. She said, but that is not... The main reason I came. He said, sir, the main reason I came was because yesterday, our three daughters, they called their mom. I said, mommy, we want to talk to you. So they went to the bedroom. We're about to start praying some prayers. They went to the bedroom. I said, mommy, we have a question. Who are witches? I said, what? Is that the question you want to ask me? We have never taught you about witches. We taught you about Jesus. So stop talking about witches. Talk about Jesus. Say, mommy, calm down. We are asking you the question again. Mommy, who are witches? So I say, stop asking that question. Say, mommy, we are very serious. You better answer the question. Who are witches? Then she now saw that this is a serious matter. She now said they are bad spirits, they are bad people, they drink blood, they do all kinds of terrible things. God doesn't like them, nobody likes them. The daughter said, Mommy, we just wish to announce to you, all three of us are witches. And I want to tell you and daddy, the next three days, we are having a conference. 
So don't sleep in this bedroom. That's where the meeting will take place. That's what brought her to church. She never used to go to church. She used to think that those who go to church are those who have problems. But not mean that all three daughters have been initiated. All the destruction of the shop, sacking of daddy, bad leg, were being operated by their own children. Children, they never cared about their spiritual lives. Close your eyes where you are. Can you raise up your right hand and shout this loud and clear? Holy God! Overshadow my home! In the name of Jesus! Somebody should be shouting this prayer loud and clear. Pasika tenda kaya boshende raba. Amen. Now say, the power of deliverance. Say it loud and clear. Whether you are married or not, you don't have children or or not, shout it loud and clear. Fall upon my children in the name of Jesus. Jesus name we pray. I will tell you the rest of that story another time. What happened to that woman? But that's not what we're going this morning. So from the scriptures we've read, number one, the Lord commands parents, it's a commandment to train, nurture, and bring up their children in the way of the Lord. From these scriptures we've read, it's a commandment to train, to nurture. And to bring up their children in the way of the Lord. Two, these scriptures we've read, they are telling us that God has delivered our children's bodies, soul, thoughts, lives, and future into our hands. God has delivered our children's bodies, souls, thoughts, lives, future into our hands. Three, we must never shrink from our duty to bring them up for the Lord. We must never shrink. Our teenage teachers, Children, teachers, the greatest headache they have is from parents who are not doing enough. Parents who are not doing much to help. Imagine the teenage church, the children church, they start teaching children at 8 o'clock, then the parents will come and drop the children at 10 o'clock. So those children, they've missed two hours of teaching. Parents yourself have missed three hours of service. How do you want that child to be serious for Jesus? Fourth point. Parents, not school, not church, have the primary responsibility to bring up their children in the way of the Lord. School can help. Church can help. Although there are very few schools that help now. Because many, many schools are confused. I've been a teacher in a, in a secondary school before in this Lagos. On Monday, at the assembly, we sing, Darling Jesus, Darling Jesus, Oh my darling Jesus, you are a wonderful Lord. I love you so much, darling Jesus. Oh my darling Jesus, you are a wonderful Lord. That is what we sing Monday morning. Then on Friday, la 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 la. So there's confusion. So the children now are confused, confused. One is say marry one wife. This one say you can marry as many as four. It's confused now. Doesn't know what to do. So parents, not school. Not church have the primary responsibility of bringing up their children in the way of the Lord. Parents must train their children because those children are arrows in the arms of the Lord. Parents must train their children because children are born with a nature that is inclined to sin. Parents must train their children because children are born without knowledge. Parents must train their children 
Because children are imitators. Imitators. While I was in the science world, I, went, uh, I was passing through somewhere, so I went to say hello to a professor. And I saw him with horse whip, beating the children. So I was begging. I said, Prof, leave them alone. What is the problem? He said, they were smoking mats. They converted the mats like cigarettes and they were smoking it. I said, Prof, is that why you are beating them? I said, yes. But Prof, you are smoking pipe. You are smoking pipe. And you know you are beating them for smoking mats. I said, Prof, sorry, oh, this is unfair. They are just copying what you are doing. Children are imitators. They imitate. Parents must train their children. Because children are very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Parents must train their children. Because children have great potentials. Great potentials. Parents must train their children. Because children are the carriers of the culture. Carriers of the culture. Prophet Eli was a successful priest. But failure as a parent. And he died with his two sons on the same day. The future of the children depends on the parents. This is a serious information. And we must take action. Many parents don't know anything about godly parenting. They are ignorant on what to do. Some erroneously they believe that God will take care of everything so they have nothing to do. Some have done over commitment to their work and career. They have no time for anybody. Some are ignorant of their parental responsibilities. They just have plenty of those children but they don't know what to do. Career-driven father, career-driven mother, they have no time for the children. Many don't have time to even stay with the children at all. A lot of parents spend most of their time in the rat race to provide properties and materials. But the greatest challenge are the bad examples parents leave. So failure to plan, failure to pray, failure to play with your children will cause trouble. Favoritism too among children will cause trouble, just like Joseph. Failure to learn parenting skills will of course cause trouble. This is a serious matter. And I want you to understand it very well. One strange thing in history, you read it, about one man they call Fela Anukulaku Kuchi. His parents were priests. He ended up marrying 27 wives later. See the problem? And one of the greatest challenges that we have as pastors is children who have hypocritical parents. When you are living a hypocritical life before your children, they know that you are a hypocrite. When you fail to speak the truth, you fail to be honest, it is clear to them that you are telling lies. When there is disunity among the parents, they see that you are not united. When you are not praying for them enough, they see that you, you are not praying. When you pamper but not disciplined, they know that you are planning evil for them. When you allow them to keep strange friends, you are not doing their destiny any good. When you have too many that you cannot even cater for adequately, you are causing trouble. All these factors have turned many children into rebels, vagabonds, and delinquents. But there is one good news. One good news. The good news is this. Your children may rebel against your teaching. They may reject your counsel. But they are powerless against your continuous prayers. I pray that the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. What are the skills we should learn? In conclusion, before I hand over to their people, I'm going to take them point by point. One, pray to God. Sisters, those of you are not married yet. Brothers, you are not married yet. Pray to God for good and covenant children before you begin to have them. Pray before they even come. Two, give birth only to the children you can cater for. A father came complaining to me the other time. He said his senior son insulted him. I said, Daddy, where you know that you don't have money and you cannot look after plenty of children? Why do you have eight of us? Now I want to go to university. You say you cannot afford it because we are many. Why did you have many when you cannot afford it? He ran inside to go and look for what to beat the boy with. But that is not the solution. That is not the solution. Pray to God for covenant children. Give back to only the children you can cater for. Let your children live under your roof at their young age. Don't donate them to a grandma or somebody somewhere. Four, be sure to set good examples before them. Give them a good memory, good examples. 
If you are a prayer person, your children will know. If you are a Bible person, they know. They will know that you are a Bible person. You are not, they will know. A pastor visited the family and the pastor said, bring, go and bring the Bible. So they call their son. Go and bring the Bible. He said, Bible, where is it? He said, that book we used to read. Oh, you know that book we used to read? But I ran inside. Brought a book. Short stories about tortoise. That's what the boy brought. Five. Provide loving discipline. Loving discipline. Six. Spend time with them. Seven. Never use foul language on them. Foul language. Curses and things like that. Don't try it. Eight. Pray for them. Listen to them and share with them. Pray for them persistently. This is where we're going to stop today. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. And may all those parents who are in Mountain of Fire and are giving our teachers and the teenage children just a hard time. They put upon their children what they themselves don't wear. The children leave the home dressing like prostitutes and they come in with their parents to church and the parents cannot say, no, you can't dress like this. Some even go to confront the teachers. Say, ah, no, no, don't, I don't want her to be too serious. She's still young, let her enjoy herself. But then when it backfires, they begin to trouble the pastors. Let's rise to our feet now. And raise our two hands to the Lord. And with a loud voice, begin to speak with the spirit of prophecies upon your hands. That my answer be answer of blessing. Answer of breakthrough and power. Answer of solution. Begin to prophesy upon your two hands. As you raise up those two hands to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Say, my hands. Hear the word of Lord. Become terror to the gates of hell. In the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and speak to your hands by the spirit of prophecy. In Jesus' name we pray. Before we continue again, there are seven prayers to pray again. And we have three minutes or so to pray them. Don't waste time. Strike when the iron is hot. Powers! Delay my blessings. Can you say it loud and clear? In the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and pray it. Powers delay my blessings. Basete katenda kaya boshende raba. In Jesus' name we pray. Powers behind strange battles. You are a liar. In the name of Jesus. Speak against the strange battles. In Jesus' name we pray. Say, home swallow us. Hear the word of Lord. Submit my home in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Jehovah the story changer. My life is available. Change my story. In the name of Jesus. Jehovah the story changer. My life is available. Change my story. Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Powers! Holding evil vigil against me. 
Can you say that with only anger? Die by fire in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Two more now. Every chain limiting my life. Pray in the name of Jesus. Break the limiting chains. Jesus name we pray gather only anger in your spirit now gather it seriously because of this seventh prayer say satanic visitors shout it with fire in my dreams be wasted can I hear you shouting this aha Shout it louder. Let your voice be the loudest. Sir. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus mighty name they are wasted you are welcome most delightfully praise God we have uh, just uh, a few questions here it goes like this it says is it right to keep the same account with one's husband is it right to keep same account with one husband In the modern uh, terms, we are talking about joint bank account here. Well, um, if you go through the Bible, Jesus just made uh, some flashy reference to bank in uh, Luke 19.23. I will just quickly pick the particular verse. It is about uh, the parable that uh, Jesus Christ told to his uh, the people and the servant of a nobleman that was traveling to the other country to receive kingdom and encouraging them to occupy till he comes. In, in doing it, he gave, you know, 10 pounds, pounds 1 pound each to each of the servants. And on his return, some came with more other five talents, another one with 10. But uh, one return that talent or pounds that was given to him, claiming that the nobleman wants to hit or reap where he didn't actually sow. And so Jesus Christ responded like this in verse 23 of that uh, chapter, Wherefore then gave it not thou my money into the bank, that at the coming I might have required my own with usury. That is um, if the, that flashy reference to that by Jesus himself. We are talking about that interest is usury. That's what. Now, a bank is a place of trust. Um, Bible does not, uh, however, impose the option of joint account on, uh, the, on couple. Except that the act of having joint account uh, may always be a reminder of their oneness in marriage and the trust that must exist between them that is husband and wife you will get more of uh, this emphasis in Genesis 2, 2, 2, 18 24 and 25 each of these verses is talking about the unity in marriage it can also be a metaphor you know a kind of reference to openness before them marriage in this sense therefore can be likened to joint account biblically, where everything one has belongs to the other. To this extent, we can also say it is uh, right to keep account 
with your husband or with your spouse, but not necessarily compulsory to do so. You can keep account with your husband with a caveat that the trust element between both of you is still undoubted. If joint account will split you because of some character deficit in uh, maybe in your in your your spouse, which you need to work upon, please don't go into joint account. Joint account is the soul of the family in this sense. It should be guided jealously. It is blessed blessed to trust to the point of oneness. A fearful and a doubtful spouse will not be expected to find the purpose of oneness in joint account with a very unstable husband. Therefore, we advise you to weigh the options before you. Now, the second question is this. Uh, he said, when you marry a husband that loves sex too much, what can the wife do? What can the wife do? Now, I think the, the operating verse on this is actually, you know, still uh, Genesis 2, 1, 18. I, I will respond it. We must establish what is too much sex in the first case. Who determines the scale? Noting that each partner's sex preference uh, scale differs from the other. What some spouse may call too much sex by their partner may depend on their low desire, on their low desire for sex. And so it becomes a relative thing when you are talking about excess now. Some women just don't like sex. We have said a lot of things on this here. That they are frigid and have to be worked upon to overcome their uh, they attract dryness. They, you have to really work on them to prepare them, to work them up, to actually lubricate their tracts. In that type of woman, it is difficult to say whether it's the one that is now setting the standard because of his, her weakness or that the husband is a frequent... Uh, but for our purpose here, let us uh, assume that the frequency of your husband's desire for sex is indeed higher than yours. And so it has become a kind of a tolerable to you. If this is the case, you have to work. This is where we are going. We have to work on him just as you are expected as a partner to do if it is other foundational weakness brought into marriage. You must have heard of all kinds of foundational things brought into marriage. Snoring, void wetting. There are cases when people bring that into marriage and so on and so forth. Some liabilities are imported into the marriage and incidentally Christian work into marriage that is the courtship does not allow a, a level of intimacy are enough to discover such weaknesses. So we see what we have in our marriage as what we have to manage prayerfully. Just as this case. What can this wife do? You will prayerfully and cordially you know, uh, discuss with your wife. I'm talking about effective communication. Through such discussion, you will discover the underlying, you know, causes of your husband's excessive sexual desire. A lot of time, the underlying causes or triggers may, among other things, be one. This is, this first uh, issue is closely related to parenting too. One is early exposure to sex act by parents. Parents are fond of having their thing in the presence of growing children. So such children bottle this in their subconscious and they get to marriage and find it as a place to unleash what they have learned. So they come to marriage and unleash terror on their wives sexually because that is their understanding growing up. Two, the second Possible cause may be secret indulgence in sex-enhancing drug. Idleness, if a husband is idle, has nothing to do, is for 24 hours staying at home, where else does he direct his energy? So idleness can cause it. Wrong association and its influence. And of course, routine nakedness. It could, you could be the cause, the woman. Routine nakedness before your husband may be provoking. 
through research, we know that men are more provoked sexually by their spouse's nakedness. We have the wrong impression that each time your, husband, your wife is naked, you want sex. No! Every time you see your wife naked, you think it's time for it. No, and that is why there has been continuous misunderstanding between wife and husband because getting relaxed naked before your husband sometimes provokes him. But if your wife is naked, it doesn't mean he's ready for the act. So once this foundational weakness is uh, an attitude identified, you are on the way to conquer that excessive, habitual, sexual drive in your husband. However, this is a remedy you have to offer in love, with patience and prayer. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I have two questions here. The first one says, what is the stand of MFM? on the use of wedding rings after joining in the church. Amen. MFM is an end end time church that strongly believes in the word of God and obeys the word of God to the letter. MFM goals and aims among others is to build up heavily bound and aggressive Christians. The priority in MFM is for people to make heaven. It is not a worldly church. Now, to answer your question, there is nowhere in the Bible that suggests wedding rings that it has any significant uh, religious significance. Many of us, we feel a ring symbolizes a never-ending circle of eternal love. The use of ring in a wedding came from Roman custom that predates Christianity. During this time, when arranged marriages were quite common, this token was likely a pledge to fulfill the marriage contract. My sister, because you are not wearing a wedding ring, does not make your marriage insignificant. The Bible does not mention any token of love or devotion in marriage ceremonies. But it has much to say about courtship and offer couples a clear admonition on how to treat each other. This is what we have in our marriage manual. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 downwards. Jesus himself even emphasized the importance of marriage as a lifelong commitment by referring to God's institution of the marriage covenant. Matthew 19, 4-6. My beloved sister, MFM stand firm on this. And that is why MFM joined couples with the word of God, the Holy Bible, as marriage covenant. Praise the Lord. The second question goes like this. God's word says he hates the voice. Now, what advice can we give a home experiencing domestic violence? Domestic violence or family violence can be defined as abusive or intimidating behavior in a relationship. It is very, very rampant nowadays. We have several types of domestic violence. Social, physical, sexual, emotional, economical, and even spiritual violence. The Bible says that domestic violence is a sin and wickedness. And this must be stopped if truly we are the children of the kingdom of God. As we have in Malachi Chapter 2, verses 13 to 6. In 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. A man that is abusing his wife, we are told, is worse than an infidel. He cannot manage his own home. 
our daddy the Lord told us in this place that the meaning of bridegroom is for the man to groom the wife for life. Not just for a moment. A bride that is not a patient job, but reacts violently to issues. We are told in Proverbs 14 verse 1 that such a woman scatters her whole home. However, when circles of violence is ongoing, safety of life is the first step. Ezekiel 34 verse 22 says this, I will rescue my flock and they will no longer be abused. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, when they were making an attempt to abuse him violently, in Luke 4, 28 to uh, 30, he cleverly moved out of that violent environment. This sister can meet the pastor or counselors on homes and marriages for counseling and take steps for the issue to be resolved. Like he rightly said, that God's word says he hates divorce. Divorce is not usually the step to take. If proper counselings are done with prayers, divorce is the device of Satan, the boon of lawyers, and the bane of the society. It is not from God. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Question one. I got married in 2011 to a man, but it was hell on earth. No child, beaten by him, maltreatment by the in-laws. Every week, the parents' in-law will gather their family to settle cases. There, they will be against me and insult me. As a result of all this and more, I decided to pack out since my husband said I should leave him alone. Since 2014, they never showed up or show any interest. So I decided to move on with my life by marrying another man. My question is, what should I do because I am in trouble? I don't have rest of mind. Will I make heaven? It's a wonderful question. The questioner is, all, is very, very, it's not far from salvation. It's like Agri- Agrippa the king. In the first instance, the marriage was not like that. Something happened before this time. What really happened before this time? How did you handle it? How did you allow in-laws and every other person, both qualified and unqualified, to come and settle your case? They will add to it what they are looking for is what they are, you have got. And then you yourself, you did not pray. You left God behind. You said, I don't, ha- I don't have peace. You cannot have peace when you are outside God's will. God is the owner of peace. When you put him behind, you cannot get, you cannot get peace. That is very, very sure. You are now saying, what will I do? Will I make heaven? Uh, well, nobody is the owner of heaven here. Let's hear the owner of heaven, what he's saying. In First Corinthians chapter 6, Know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, we, with, one, with mankind. Now the point here is that nor adulterers. You are, living an, you are living in adultery. And you are saying, will I make heaven? The owner of heaven will not change his standard. So you should understand that. And what you need to do is to go back to the cross, pray that the Lord will save your soul. You need to reconcile with your husband because you are living in adultery. 
we cannot write the another Bible. On the basis of that, you may be thinking, how will I handle this situation? When you see your husband, a little encouragement can spark a great accomplishment. And you should understand that God always gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. And then you know that great trials often, pre- often precede great triumphs. And heaven is prepared for people who are prepared for heaven. And you will understand that the Christian life is a battleground, not a playground. So on the basis of this, you should understand that you need to go back to God and the Lord is going to help you. You can even see happy home for further instructions. Because there are so many steps you need to take. Question two. Is it bad for a Christian to use sex-enhancing drugs whenever he wants to have sex with his wife, knowing fully well that he is not active sexually in bed and he needs to satisfy his wife so she doesn't go, so that she doesn't go and meet other men outside? Please, what is the position of the church? You can imagine. Every other thing, people are asking from God, God bless me, God do this, God do that. His own concern is drugs, how to perform well on bed. He has a problem. If you are having problems and you go to doctors, doctors will prescribe some drugs for you. There is no sin in that. There is no problem in that. But if you don't have any problem at all, but your own decision is that you are not performing well, In the first instance, how do you know that the woman is not satisfied? Is it it because she is not breathing like a pig when you are on her? Or is it that she is not sweating under a sea? Is that the reason why? Or is it because she is not shedding tears? Is that the reason why you think she is not satisfied? This man has an agenda. And it's only God that can deliver him. On the basis of this, he's looking for what he cannot handle. And when the, when the problem comes, they come to church. A man was in this type of things many years ago. I saw him. I witnessed it. It was in the story. This man, outside Lagos, he met a lady. And the father of the lady warned him, leave my daughter alone. My daughter wants to go to school. He did not listen. Eventually, one day, when he met the lady, after he finished, I saw him. Not that he told me. His productive organ was long and it was touching his ankle. And each time he wanted to dress up, he would take his trouser like this and then roll that long thing like somebody wants to back a baby and then put on the trouser and keep on going. Meeting him on the way, you will think you are meeting a man. Anything outside God, it is crisis. This man, he would have been denying it. I don't have any other thing outside. I don't have girlfriend. But by the time he came home and the wife saw it, you don't need any prophet to tell him that this man has done something wrong. God bless you. Praise the Lord. I have a question here. Said I went into a, an arranged marriage through my sister. I later discovered that my husband was once married with two children from two women. When I told my sister and the church where we were married, they said since the former marriage was tradition and court alone, that I should not worry. Because I did church and traditional wedding. Hearing all these messages, I became confused and don't know what to do. I want to know if I should leave because I am confused. This is my 13th year with a man and I have three children. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, this marriage was definitely based on deceit. If we go by what the sister has written, because she was led into marrying this man 
who had twice been married through customary law and through the courts without her knowledge. Her previous church that also gave her the comfort that her own marriage, because it was a church wedding, was okay, but not guided her properly. It is true that no Christian marriage is complete until a minister of God commands a blessing upon the couple. However, the fact that the two previous marriages were both traditional and court marriages without the church blessing does not negate the validity of those marriages. Those marriages are valid and acceptable. The man's previous marriages to these women and their separation makes the man a divorcee. And we know that the commandments of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, commands that a woman that a woman that separates from her husband should remain unmarried or seek to be reconciled to her husband. And the man also should see to it that he does not put away his wife. First Corinthians 7, 27, specifically now address the man. That a man should not seek to divorce his wife. And if a man has divorced his wife, he should not seek another wife. Both scriptures were also corroborated by our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 19, 3 to 10, Matthew 5, 32, Mark 10, 2 to 12, Luke 16, 18, which makes this a very serious matter. And it's not something we should really take for granted. Now, the question with the lady is this. Now she's been hearing all these messages. She's a bit concerned of her status. And she is now seeking the way out. We know that the marriage is based on deceit. And usually when people become aware of their wrong marriages, their zeal is usually to want to restitute. So this lady's question borders on restitution. Restitution is the act of returning to the rightful owner what has been stolen or wrongfully taken away. In this case, the sister claimed she was ignorant, but that does not change the position of the word of God. So restitution in this case must be done with understanding and with wisdom. Because this lady has stayed with this man for 13 years. So she is advised not to just rush out of the marriage. She should consider her children and seek for counsel, further counsel, peculiar to her situation, before taking any step. So we advise that you do not, on the basis of your circumstances, just walk away. Praise the Lord. The second question says, my fiancé has an illegal wife. My fiancé has an illegal wife. They did white wedding, but no traditional wedding. This person is the judge and the jury. According to my fiancé, the marriage was based on a lie, threat, and prophecy from the lady who claimed that if he did not marry her, he will die. After two years, the lady said she will not continue with the marriage and that if she does, she will die. Me and my fiancé, we are going to the altar. I need your advice. Praise the Lord. Amen. This sister says the legal wife. At the same time, they had a white wedding. We presume that if you had a white wedding... You either married in a state registry or in a church license to conduct wedding. If this was the case, this marriage would be seen as legal, irrespective of the fact that um, the traditional aspect was not concluded. So, this person is already married, even if he was threatened into the marriage. He was an adult at the time he contracted this marriage. 
and so he has a responsibility. So, the validity of this marriage is not in question. So for our sister that is um, seeking to marry a man who is already married, she will reconsider her position because wrong choices that are made usually will lead to unimagined pain and sorrow. Wrong choices have in fact led to untimely deaths. So since you are still free, you are not yet married, even though from the tone of your question, it's like you are already poised for the altar, we encourage you that you, are pa- you should be patient and uh, pray that God should provide you with your own husband. Praise the Lord. Let's rise up, please. As you take any song of praises in your own mouth and sing it loud and clear to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Any song of praises, just sing it loud and clear to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Stand fast, love of the Lord, never see the His mercy is never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is Thy faithful, as the first Lord has said, first Lord of the Lord, never see His hand. His mercy is never come to an end. Hallelujah. They are new every morning, always new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, great is thy faithfulness. Blessed be that name of the Lord. It's worthy to be praised and adored. Hallelujah. So we lift up holy hands with one accord. Singing, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Hallelujah. Blessed be Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou art created. Said, my father, my father, my father, defend your interest in my life. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and decree. Defend your interest in my life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the power in the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for this wonderful gathering here this morning. 
Father, I decree upon everyone here that whether it is convenient for the enemy or not, whether the enemy likes it or not, you shall fulfill your destiny. Every agenda of darkness or frustration you shall collapse. Every imagination against your life shall be scattered. Wherever you go, the glory of God, the favor of God shall overshadow your life. As you continue into this month, it shall be well with you. The Lord will arise for your sake in the mighty name of Jesus. The kind of progress you have never made before, the Lord will empower you to make it in the name of Jesus. Sorrow, tragedy, and shame shall not be your lot in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord blesses you from Zion. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The prayer requests, oh Lord, answer them by fire. To you, Father, be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And let us share the grace and fellowship. Seven miracle receiving hallelujah. Let's go.